Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for being here. I uh, uh, don't have any opening uh, announcements to make. Uh, I have uh, with me today uh, Jack Liu, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, someone you know, uh, you all know very well. What, what I'd like to do is have uh, the top portion of this briefing, uh, if we could take questions that you might have about the President's speech yesterday, the policy vision he laid out, uh, and the process uh, that he's put in motion to try to realize that vision. We'll do all those questions at the top. Jack is here to answer uh, a significant portion of them. Others I might uh, answer. But what Jack's going to have to leave uh, at, at, a, at a point after that. And I don't want to have to restart the briefing. So if we can do, I'll go on and answer questions on other subjects. But let's, let's do uh, this subject at the top, and then we can move on to other things. Uh, with that in mind, I'll start with the Associated Press. Jim. Thank you. Jack, uh, the, the President is calling for a trillion dollars in tax revenue over 12 years, and that's an addition of over the, uh, the roughly $700 billion from the uh, expiry uh, Bush era tax provisions. Can the President guarantee that that extra trillion dollars is not going to touch anybody but that top 2% of earners? And if that's the case, does that mean that those that wealthiest Americans are going to have like a $1.8 trillion tax, new tax burden? Look, to be clear, the expiration of the, uh, the tax rates that were in the Bush tax cut are assumed in our budget uh, because the President, as he said yesterday, uh, will not uh, agree to extend them again. Uh, on top of that, the President has proposed that we go through a process of tax reform where we broaden the base and we eliminate the uh, exclusions and preferences, tax expenditures. And if you look at where the benefit of those tax expenditures go, the vast majority of special provisions and, uh, and preferential rates are uh, for those with the highest incomes. And uh, it's certainly not necessary uh, to, to have broad-based tax increases uh, in order to get the savings that were in the package that the President outlined yesterday. So you say most of the benefits go to, does that mean that those are the only places that those in savings would be targeted? In order to achieve the savings that uh, were outlined yesterday in the framework, it is not necessary to go uh, below that point, uh, to, to, to go below the threshold. Um, and that's what the President has proposed. Jay, so it's not call. necessary to go below 250000 at all? No one under 250000 will get a tax increase. 250 for a family, 200 for a 200 for an interest rate. 250 for a no tax increase for anyone making under $200,000 a year. Obviously, we're talking about a proposal. The President has put forth a framework, and that is what the President has proposed, yes. Okay, if I could follow sure. up. Sure. The tone of the President's speech yesterday, he, he talked about the Republicans' pessimistic view of, of America and how they want to break the, the social compact. Uh, then he talked about finding common ground, and I'm wondering, what part of the pessimistic vision he can embrace? <laughs> well, a, a fair question, Jim, but I, I think I would point out that what the President did yesterday was describe uh, the vision put forward by the House Republican plan and describe his, uh, his own vision, his, uh, the vision that he thinks is preferable uh, and which is embodied in the proposal he then put forward. Uh, what is true is that these are competing visions and that, they're, uh, that these are contentious issues. Uh, there's a long history in Washington of uh, contentious issues being resolved uh, in a bipartisan way. It's been done under uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Uh, you know, George, the first President Bush, as President uh, Obama pointed out yesterday, President Clinton with Speaker Gingrich. This, just because uh, there's a lot of heat in these discussions and these debates, a lot of uh, uh, firmly held convictions doesn't mean that we cannot come together and find common ground. The President believes that. Uh, but he also thinks it's very important to make clear what his vision is uh, and to contrast it to the vision put forward in the House Republican budget. Uh, that's an important thing to do. Uh, it does, but he still very firmly believes that we can find common ground, that with, just as we did last week. Uh, and uh, in December, and as uh, previous presidents uh, dealing in a similar divided government situation have done to achieve big things in the past. Uh, so the confidence uh, is there, the optimism is there, uh, and uh, he looks forward to a, uh, the process that he initiated yesterday, uh, moving uh, 
forward quickly because he thinks this is uh, important work that needs to get done. Dan. Uh, how does Social Security um, fit into that vision in terms of you know, raising the, the retirement age to 70? Perhaps what's the White House position? Well, I think uh, I'll, uh, Jack can handle the policy side of that. Go ahead. The President has a number of occasions, including yesterday and going back to the State of the Union, made clear that he thinks that it's important that we deal with Social Security and that we deal with it now. Um, but it, Social Security is a different issue than these other fiscal challenges. The real problem is a 75-year problem. The problem is that we have an obligation uh, to keep Social Security sound so the people who are working today and who are going to be retiring and getting benefits many years from now can count on the system. Um, it did, Social Security did not cause the deficit we have now. Social Security ran a surplus for many, many years, since 1983. Um, and the Social Security Trust Fund was built up to a point where if we weren't in the bad fiscal conditions we were in, it would be in fine shape. So it's not fair to put it in the same place as other things that are being discussed for deficit reduction. It is a parallel and important challenge, but it's not the same. And um, you know, we would very much like to engage in a process to work through Social Security where we learned in the 1980s. I was involved in 1983. I was involved in 1981 and 82 when we didn't have such great consensus on Social Security. I was involved in 1983 when we did. When reasonable people look for the sensible middle, you can agree on Social Security. It's actually not as complicated as a matter of policy as health care is. Um, and we need to get to the process of having that conversation uh, without coming with preconditions and lots of, of statements in advance. The suggestion that we should be laying down a policy on Social Security, my own view as somebody who's lived through battles on Social Security is that's not the way to advance the dialogue. As soon as one party lays down a position, the other parties take a counter position. The way to make progress on Social Security is to say we're going to protect Social Security for 75 years, we want to do it in a way that's reasonable and balanced, and to have the conversation. So I think the President's shown leadership on it on a number of occasions, putting it out there in the frame, which I personally believe is the way you can make progress. Um, let me get to Jeff. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, may I ask kind of a wonky question? Another, <laughs> another area where the Republicans and Democrats don't necessarily agree is on the debt limit. Um, is the White House, is the administration preparing contingency plans now already for the possibility that the debt ceiling will not be extended, such as through a staggered default? I think one of the very encouraging things about the leadership meeting yesterday was that all parties agreed that it's unthinkable that the United States would not be able to meet its obligations on its debt. Um, the full faith and credit of the United States is something that we have a real obligation, a trust relationship with our people, not to undermine. Um, and that's why we've said these issues shouldn't be connected, the debt limit should just be extended, and we need to have this urgent debate on our fiscal condition. Um, I, I think that Secretary of Treasury has made clear in his communications with Congress what kinds of flexibility he has uh, if we reach a debt limit. Um, and they're very limited. It's been his view, and I think correctly, that there should be no misunderstanding of what our levers are, what our options are. So we've been transparent with the Congress. Uh, there isn't anything else that besides what the Secretary of the Treasury has shared with Congress. And everyone should know that it's not like the government shutdown. Um, it will be a very bad thing if all of the cable TV stations have countdown clocks to government default. The fact of anticipation would in and of itself undermine uh, our uh, position as, as an economic power. So nobody should be playing chicken with the debt limit. We should get it done. We should get it done soon, early, and get it out of the way. How much? Can you address the wonky part, though? Is, is the staggered default something that the White House is looking at in terms of contingency planning? Mm -hmm. We have outlined to the Congress all the levers that we have. Okay. Um, Jack, if, if you could help us um, understand some of the more stark depictions that President Obama laid out yesterday of, of the Ryan plan. Um, he said that 65-year-olds uh, would have to pay $6,500 more in their Medicare. He said 50 million Americans potentially could lose their health care. I assume that's combined with the repeal of the health care Bill, is that right or no? The 50 million number. Um, I'd have to go back and, ch and check. But in any case, he said that um, seniors wouldn't be able to afford nursing homes, 
uh, poor children would lose their health care, uh, middle class families who have children with disabilities would not be able to care for them. Could you explain sure. um, how the Ryan plan would do that? So let me go through the pieces. Uh, it really flows from several different pieces of the Republican budget. Um, on Medicare, uh, the proposal that they put forward is that uh, we basically move from where we are now, which is a defined benefit plan, to a system which, if it were in the private sector, you'd call it a defined contribution plan. There's a bit of a disagreement as to what it's called. Um, you know, the congressman calls his plan premium support. We've called it vouchers. I will just say that the people who designed the idea of premium support have said they don't think it's premium support. So it, this is not something that we've, we've uh, said. I mean, if you talk to Henry Aaron or Alice Rivlin, both of whom you know, have embraced the idea of premium support at various points, they haven't, they've said that this is not what it means. But the way it would work is that instead of getting a benefit package when you turn 65, which is what happens now, you'd get a check. You'd get the ability to pay a premium. The problem is it won't cover the cost of the package. If the package gets more expensive, the retired person would be on their own. The estimate that the president used reflects the fact that between out-of-pocket expenses and premiums out-of-pocket, a senior citizen would have to spend $6,400 more. Now, we think that takes you back to what were the pre-Medicare days when many, in fact, most old people couldn't afford health insurance. Uh, most old people don't have $6,000 to spend uh, out of pocket. Um, and if you don't, if you have to choose between a health insurance premium and food on the table, that's a very bad choice to, to, to force uh, people to make in, in their retirement. $6,400, where does that come from? It's a combination of what the estimated cost of the Medicare package would be plus the out-of-pocket expenses uh, un under insurance. So it, it's, it's a calculation that's been worked out based on where you would be under the current system versus where you would be uh, if the, if the uh, Republican plan were to take effect. Now, it's clear here where they get the savings. I'm not going to challenge that there are savings. What they've said is that the risk of escalating health care costs um, should be shifted from the common wheel, from the federal government, to the individual. And um, if you take that risk away from the Medicare program and say that each individual will bear it, it does reduce spending, but it doesn't provide the kind of benefit package that we have today. The argument that's made is that the system will be competitive, there will be alternatives out there. Uh, you know, it wasn't the case before Medicare. We didn't have lots of competition for uh, retired people to get uh, health insurance on their own. And uh, the, 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 the stark reality is it's a, it's a very different world. It is not Medicare as we know it today. It's not a defined benefit plan, which everyone uh, is participating in. Now, in terms of the, the you know, nursing home care and, and disabled children, that's more of a Medicaid issue than a Medicare issue. Um, you know, ev everyone um, knows that Medicaid is not one federal program. It's 50 state programs. Um, what the Republican plan would do would be to you know, block grant it, give a great deal of flexibility to the states, and lower funding, and tell the states, you run your programs with less money. Well, if you run the programs with less money, you have to ask what's going to give. And where all the cost growth in Medicaid is, or most, much of the cost growth is, is long-term care for elderly people and disabled people. And it is just not plausible that in a world where the resources given to the states was so severely constrained, uh, that with all the flexibility in the world, uh, they'd be able to provide the kind of benefits, especially where it's growing most quickly, which is in long-term care. So you're assuming that the states would take seniors on Medicaid and people with disabilities or parents with children with disabilities on Medicaid off because those are the areas that are growing the fast. That, that, that's where the cost growth is. The alternative would be to take away benefits from everyone else who gets uh, benefits. I mean, the, the, the pie wouldn't be big enough. So the question is, what would give? You know, clearly, the areas of growth have been in the areas of the president mentioned. But it's not actually based on anything factually in the in the Ryan proposal. Well, I, I, I think that you know, when we make policy based on projections and expectations of what's going to happen, um, and I think it is a very reasonable projection that the kinds of choices created by the block granting and the reduced um, funding would make it impossible to have the mix that we have today. And the only thing that could be reduced in order to keep the growth under control 
would be that kind of long-term care and, and the care for disabled. It would be very hard to get the savings any other way. So, you know, the, the, I, it, 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 it's, it's a little more challenging than Medicare because it would depend on a lot of decisions made in the states. So I think there is a degree of variability. I don't think that there's any question but that it would put in motion a set of constraints that would require the results that the President described. Thank you. Chad, uh, staying on Medicare, but on the President's plan, he said yesterday after going through uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, proposals he has, uh, he said that it, that will enable us, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, excuse me, that will enable us to uh, save $500 billion by 2023 and an additional trillion dollars in the decade after that. And then he said if we're wrong, uh, then it would be given to this independent commission, which would have more th authority to act. Um, number one, is one and a half trillion dollars really enough to uh, make Medicare and Medicaid solvent or take them uh, out of the category of something we really need to fear? Is that enough money? And number two, isn't this proposal to give it to an independent commission uh, kind of the definition of kicking the can down the road? First of all, I, I think that it, it's important to take a step back and remember that we're not starting uh, on square one. We've enacted the Affordable Care Act. We've put in motion the most uh, sweeping policy changes that would give us, in fact, the ability to what we call bend the cost curve, lower the cost growth in health care in this country. And that's the real answer to how do we uh, deal with the problems of Medicare and Medicaid. It's the answer to how do we deal with the problems of health care expenses in the economy generally. Um, it's not the case that Medicare and Medicaid are growing faster than health care costs generally. Medicare and Medicaid are growing a little less than or with, depending on what measures you look at, the health care costs in the overall economy. Um, the Affordable Care Act put very important uh, provisions in place to help us to start to bend the cost curve. Um, I think that the independent panel that you're talking about is, it's not a commission, it, it is a, a panel of experts that would set constraints on spending in these programs. And um, it would limit the growth in the programs uh, to a level that would require, you know, changes in reimbursement practices and, and the like. Um, it is, it is uh, a very real set of policies, and it's not the same as a study commission. Is a, trillion and a, is a trillion and a half dollars really the kind of money you need, though, to get this under control? I think that if you combine um, the impact of the Affordable Care Act and the impact of the proposals that the President laid out yesterday, it is very dramatic savings in Medicare and Medicaid. If we're successful, as I believe we will be with the implementation of these programs to reduce the overall health care growth, we will be well on our way towards dealing with the, the, the challenge of, of keeping those programs uh, solve it. What is the number? If it's not a trillion and a half, if you're adding in the effects of the Affordable Care Act, what is the number? What is so the number? I'd have to get back to you. With the, I, I, I've been focusing on budget numbers, not trust, fair, tr trust fund solvency numbers. So I, I don't want to off the cuff uh, make up a, a trust fund solvency number. <coughs> I'm just, uh, oh, okay. just following up kind of. Uh, so you said when Jake was asking about Medicaid and if they give it to states and these states are going to, and they have limited funds, the states are going to make these tough decisions and it's going to hurt older folks and young, disabled kids, et cetera. But you guys envision cutting Medicaid, right? So, I mean, aren't, they, aren't there going to be cuts that affect them? I mean, couldn't the same assumption be made about your own plan? No, I, I think everything is a matter of degree. Um, and you look at the magnitude of savings uh, in the Republican budget um, that are concentrated in Medicaid and, frankly, more broadly in programs that serve poor people, um, it would very much change the social fabric of this country. I think that in Medicaid, um, you know, flexibility of the states is something the President has said he wants to work on. Dealing with the problem of the so-called dual eligibles, people who are in Medicare and Medicaid, is something he wants to work with the states on. And correcting the way we reimburse uh, under these programs to make sure that we're only paying once and we're paying the right amount, making sure that uh, programs don't become ways of overbilling the federal government, whether it's from a provider or the way states bill the federal government uh, for their share of reimbursement. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at uh, in our savings. And I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It is tough, the stuff in our budget. Our, our budget has the deepest Medicare and Medicaid savings that I've ever been part of putting together. It's going to have an impact. It's going to put pressure on the system, but it won't do it in a way that pushes the risk to the beneficiary. And, and that's a difference that makes a difference. Right. The President laid out his plan. Ryan's laid out his plan. Uh, Gang of Six is working on their plan. And the Deficit Commission 
folks when they left seem to be saying that maybe the gang of six was the great hope. Is that where the common ground comes in? I mean, is that where, are you guys really hopeful that they'll be a key to making this all come together? Well, when the president met with the co-chairman of the of the deficit commission, he w he he was very much appreciative of the work that they had done, very complimentary of the work they had done, and very grateful that they said they wanted to stay involved. Um, the the, the so-called gang of six um, is doing important work. It's having a bipartisan conversation on tough stuff where there are members who are doing things that take them away from the kind of mainstream of each of their um, caucuses. Um, you know, it's important that they continue their work um, you know, and, uh, and that that kind of a bipartisan conversation grow. I think what the President laid out yesterday in terms of his meeting with the leaders was a very uh, practical process for how do you get from here to where we need to go. And uh, I think that you'll see that when Congress comes back uh, at the beginning of May from, from the, the you know, recess, um, the Vice President will meet with the leaders uh, and uh, lay out the issues that they need to work through uh, with a pretty tight deadline. I mean, the goal of having progress by Memorial Day and something that we can vote on by the end of June is a, it's a significant um, challenge. Um, the more support there is for ideas in the broad center, the better off we'll be. But it's the work of the, the, the leaders, the president, the vice president, those of us on the economic team, to really drive the process forward. And we very much hope to have the, the support of the, the, the groups that are working to find a sensible middle. Considering the tone in this town, though, following the speech yesterday, um, is it realistic to get something done that quickly? You know, I, I think that, um, if one asks what's realistic um, going forward, uh, the most popular thing in Washington is to say it's impossible to get anything done. Early December, everyone said it was impossible that there would be agreement on the tax bill. They certainly thought it was impossible that the START Treaty would be ratified. Um, going back just a week ago, everyone thought it would be impossible that we could reach agreement between the White House and the, the Congress on uh, historic reductions in spending. Congress is voting on those today. Um, I tend to be an optimist. Uh, I tend to, to also be a realist. I think that um, we're, we're, we're facing a very real um, sense of urgency because uh, it's not an acceptable thing to have the world asking questions, is the United States taking its uh, fiscal future seriously? Uh, that's something we, we, we need to address uh, because it is a real issue. And uh, it's not because of something being tied to something else. It's because we have to, for our own uh, creditworthiness, for our own uh, financial stability, demonstrate that Washington can make decisions. The scope of what we can make decisions on, obviously there are limits to what you can do in 30 days or 60 days. I think that um, you know, there is a lot of progress was made just yesterday. The first step of reaching a bipartisan consensus, in my experience, certainly was true in the 1980s and the 1990s, was to have an agreement on the shape of the problem. If we can agree that the shape of the problem is that we need to be looking at $4 trillion of deficit reduction over the next 10 to 12 years, we've made progress already. Once responsible leaders define a problem, they then take on the burden of finding a solution. And I think that coming back from the recess, uh, we will sit down together and it will be a challenge. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that we're going to meet once and walk out of the room and everyone will be kind of holding hands saying we finished our work. But I, I think that uh, by Memorial Day we can have significant progress and, uh, and we're going to do our very best to have something to vote on at the end of June. No, I, I, I got to let Jack go, but one more for Jack, uh, quick, Carol. Quick follow on, on Social Security. It sounds like you're saying that the President, by being vague on specifics, which makes it more likely that something would actually happen. Is that an accurate well, reason? Well, I, I, I would characterize it a little bit differently. I think by setting out principles as opposed to hard lines, and by saying that we need to sit down together and work quickly to deal with it, he's outlined a frame for the way we have successfully dealt with Social Security in the past. And uh, I think that's an invitation that's sincere. He's repeated it on many occasions. I've certainly repeated it on many occasions. And I think that it should be parallel to these conversations, not part of them. But it's something that we should waste no time in getting on to. Thank you. Thank you.
So picking up from there, yes, Mike. Um, when the president says he wants a final agreement by the end of June, what are his parameters for the scope of that agreement? When he says final agreement, does he mean an agreement that has $4 trillion of savings over 10 or 12 years? Does he mean just whatever it takes to get this debt limit through Congress? And it can't be because of the financial markets. The last time I checked, 10-year bond yields were under 3.5%. So what, what, is, what is it that, what is the scope that would be acceptable for that final agreement race? And how hard and fast is that end of, the, end of June deadline? Well, I think there is uh, a process that he laid out both yesterday in his speech and in the room more, uh, in more detail with the leadership that uh, requires a certain amount of focus and urgency to, to address these issues. As, as Jack just said, you can't, you can't solve all of this. You can't do all of this in 30 or 60 days, obviously. But what, what you can agree on is uh, a definition of the problem, a framework for how to approach addressing the problem and and some targets and goals about how you achieve uh, some accomplishments towards uh, a solution now I, and, and even that is is as uh, specific as I think we can be at this point because they need to do their work and find um, uh, find what they can achieve that's substantive and real uh, uh, within that time frame that demonstrates the fact that this, these very is difficult issues are being addressed in a bipartisan way by a very serious group of lawmakers uh, and, uh, and so that we can keep moving forward and address the problem. So it's kind of like a framework would be enough. You could well, again, yeah, and, and I don't even, how you define that, uh, I think, and the details of that will, will be determined by uh, the, those uh, negotiators who are part of the process. And, and uh, that could be, you know, there could be a lot of uh, substantial detail attached to that. Or, uh, but you know what is important is that is that the progress is being made. What I what I want to emphasize is what Jack said is that obviously you know these are these are large problems that uh, to to uh, address all in a piece of legislation in 30 to 60 days obviously is 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 a, is a reach. But you can make significant progress in that time frame, and that's what the president is asking uh, the members uh, of this group of negotiators, bipartisan, bicameral, uh, to do. Mark. Jay, can you tell us what President Obama meant when he said in his speech he wants to make the tax code more simple and fair? I think he wants to make the tax code more simple and more simple. fair. It's filled with uh, a lot of complexities, a lot of loopholes, a lot of uh, uh, things that I think uh, the average Amer makes the average American tear his or her hair out when they're trying to do their taxes. And so uh, the goal of tax reform is to make the code more simple and more fair, and, and that's a principle that he's applied uh, previously in his uh, uh, goal of corporate tax reform, and, and, and he, 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 he applied the same principle when he discussed uh, individual tax reform yesterday. And uh, I think that um, that would be a process, an outcome that would be welcome uh, by uh, every, working, in every American who pays taxes. Is raising tax rates on some but not at all, is that fair? Well, what, is, uh, what the President made clear is that in order to address our significant deficit and long-term debt problem, that we have to uh, have shared responsibility as well as shared opportunity and shared prosperity. And the, uh, the fact is that in a time of constraints, in a time when we have to make tough choices about how we invest taxpayers' money, uh, we have to be extremely rigorous in deciding uh, what's vital, what's a priority, and what, uh, and what can be cut, uh, it's important that, that, uh, that the burden is shared and the burden is fair. And what the President firmly believes is that we cannot extend the Bush tax cuts for, for the wealthiest Americans uh, at the cost of $750 billion, I believe the figure is, over 10 years, when, when we have this mountain of def uh, debt to deal with. And, and uh, so uh, it's about balance. And, uh, and uh, shared burden so that we can all share in, in equally in the prosperity of this country. Do you know if he has sent in his taxes yet? Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I'll get, uh, get back to you on it. Okay. Yes. Do you guys still disagree that that speech yesterday had sharp political overtones? What the speech did, Savannah, was uh, 
explain the problem to the American people because this is, this is complicated stuff. Americans know very well that we have a deficit problem and a debt problem. Explain, I'll, I'll get to that, and, and, and ex to explain the problem and how we got there, which is important to know so that, because uh, it helps give us, uh, it helps explain the best way to get, to get out of there, to get out of the problem, out of the hole that we've dug uh, for ourselves in this country. Then to uh, look at and explain, describe one vision for how we should get there, which is the House Republican proposal. Uh, it, the President believes that Chairman Ryan's very sincere, that he's, uh, and, and that the proposal is, is, is reflects his beliefs, and that's, and that's important, and, and the fact that he shares the goal that the President shares, and the House Republicans share the goal, and, and, and I think leaders of both parties share the goal that we need to seriously address our deficit and, and debt problems, and share the goal, uh, roughly, of uh, the same target in terms of deficit reduction over 10 or 12 years, $4 trillion. That's important. How we get there is also very important, and what the President did was describe uh, one vision and then describe his own. And, uh, you know, the fact that there are stark disagreements about uh, how you get there and what those visions are, you know, is, there an, is a reality that we shouldn't uh, uh, hide from. Uh, but what he did was describe it as, and then describe his own vision. And he believes that, you know, it, it's not yesterday that, that there were serious disagreements on major issues in this, uh, in this country or this, this city. Uh, and yet, we have been able to meet the challenge of reaching a bipartisan consensus to uh, deal with these really thorny questions in the past, and, and he believes that we can do that. So are you saying the speech was devoid of politics or political motivations? I, you have to define by what you mean by politics and political motivations. He was, he was laying out his vision uh, on a very a substantive issue, wonky issue, if you will, deficits, debts, spending, entitlements, interest payments, uh, you know, Pentagon spending. You know, this is not a campaign speech. This is a policy speech. Uh, the fact that there are competing visions between one political party and the other is a reality that uh, we need to uh, be aware of as we go forward. And, 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 and explaining the differences is an important process as we negotiate through, because uh, you know, the American people need to hear what the differing ideas are as they make assessments about what, uh, you know, what the right answers are, and they, and, they li and they watch the process, this bipartisan process, as it begins after the recess, uh, and, and, and assess the progress it's making. Why mention the 2012 presidential candidate? Uh, I think that he was, again, making the point that there is, there are some firmly held convictions, earnestly, firmly, sincerely held convictions on both sides. And I think that's, that's legitimate. Uh, that's why we have the system we have. And uh, in an era of divided government, uh, the way to get things done when the issues are tough is through compromise uh, and bipartisan negotiation. And that is what he set up in that speech and in his meeting yesterday with the leaders. Do you agree that there's some distance between sorry. those Republican candidates? Sorry, say would, again. Would you agree that there's some distance between the Republican candidates you referred to in that speech and the Ryan budget proposal. The, the speech made it sound like the, all the candidates on the Republican side had embraced. I don't, embraced think, you said, I don't think you said that, and I honestly haven't analyzed where potential candidates from the other party are on many things and, and or on this budget. So I, I that's I don't I think you're mischaracterizing what he said. I think the point is that um, the, the the budget proposal, which has been widely. Um, uh, analyzed and in many ways uh, applauded by you know, elements of the Republican Party, which is fine because it, it represents, you know, a, a clear view of things. Uh, it, you know, that's uh, pointing that out is 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 pointing out a simple fact, and then describing it in the way he described it, you know, was uh, was I think a fair thing to do as he laid out his own vision for what we should do to address these difficult problems. Jake. Do you guys have any comment on the Congressional Budget Office um, report that indicated that instead of $38.5 billion in savings from the budget deal or $78.5 billion from the budget deal, it's actually $352 million? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I wish you had asked uh, Jack that, that question. I don't, uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a comment on that. Maybe you can get back to us. Right, thanks, Kevin. Sure. Um, 
for the sake of this question, if we could posit that this is, just to remove this talking point from the equation, that this is the most transparent administration in history. That said, <laughs> do you have any comment on the Center for Public Integrity study indicating that there are a lot of holes in the, in the um, visitors' logs, uh, that a lot of people come and, and don't sign the visitors' mm -hmm. logs, uh, and there seem to be some problems with them? Well, I, what I would say, uh, in addition to pointing out, uh, because uh, while I, I think it's possible that all the television stations and networks in the country and the world who are watching this might play your soundbite about the fact that uh, this is the most transparent administration in no, history, I, I, I think it's but I'm glad you acknowledged it. The the uh, <laughs> laughter but, reflected. But let me. That's not sincere. Okay. Let me. Let me. Uh, no, fair point. Fair point. No, but the uh, but it is. You know, we have made extraordinary efforts. This president has made extraordinary efforts at, uh, to. Uh, to demonstrate uh, the transparency that he thinks is vitally important. What I would note about the fact that we release records that have never been released before is that the system of the wave system uh, that, that uh, from which these, uh, these releases are drawn is not designed for, uh, it's not visitor's logs, they're not designed for public release, they're designed for security reasons. So. Uh, the fact that it's incomplete is not a reflection of uh, any effort to withhold information. We release the information uh, that we that we have in ways that have never been bef done before by any administration of any party, and and we continue to work on ways to uh, uh, enhance the transparency that we've achieved already. But did that? I don't. I don't, I don't have a comment on the report except to say that it's an that, that the system is not designed for. Uh, this use that we've put it to, which is to release the information, it's a security system designed to protect the first family, the second family, the people who work here. It, the, just to, the, the report seemed to suggest that there are people who, not for security reasons, not CIA officers off the fields of, of, of Afghanistan, but Stevie Wonder or celebrities, people who have come here who, who don't show up in the visitors' well, again, lives. I think you, you could address that question to how they I deal with it to the Secret Service. I would say that one point that they seemed to make a big deal about was that uh, uh, assistants uh, often are the names attached to who's visited because assistants tend to clear people in. Often, if, if somebody's seeing, uh, you know, Jack Lou over at uh, OMB or or me or whatever, that, that that somebody in that office will be the name associated with clearing someone in. That's how the system works. So that if there's a problem at the gate, they know who to call to clear something up or to make sure that the person who's visiting is the right person and why the information may not match. So, so I think there's, uh, you know. The, the system is there for security reasons. The processes that the processes that are are, are used by the Secret Service, I'd have to refer um, questions about that to them. But our effort at transparency is is uh, you know broad and sincere, and we continue to make efforts to be uh, to to earn our reputation as the most transparent uh, administration in history every day. Uh, Jim, and then I'm going to get to the back rows. Yeah. I just wanted to ask Olivia a question, if I could. Does, does the President agree with, uh, with David Cameron and, and President Sarkozy that there should be uh, more intensified strikes by NATO in Libya? And is there any intent uh, now to, for the President to join them in some kind of joint statement on, on Libya at this point? Well, I, you know, the, the, the leaders of those countries are close, you know, those countries are close allies. We have very close relationships with those, uh, with uh, Britain and France, and, and uh, the President has an uh, extremely uh, good working relationship with the leaders of those countries. And uh, we also have uh, great confidence in uh, NATO's capacity to fulfill the mission uh, of uh, implementing United Nations Security Council Resolution 1973. I would note, actually, that uh, it's my understanding that strikes, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the tempo of the campaign uh, questions about that should be asked at uh, NATO or at the Defense Department, but it is my understanding uh, that that tempo has picked up. I mean, it, you know, it depends on the operations that they're uh, undertaking. So uh, we remain confident that that, uh, that NATO is fully capable of executing the mission, and remember what the mission is. Well, they Clearly they defined, uh, enforce the no-fly zone, enforce the arms embargo, and protect civilians. Uh, it is not uh, described at all in any way in that uh, mission statement from the Security Council resolution uh, that uh, regime change should be affected through military force, uh, that the mission on paper is the mission that NATO is enforcing, and we are obviously uh, a partner uh, in that mission and a, and, a, and a member of NATO, 
uh, and uh, part of the uh, part of the implementation of that mission in a support and assist role. Well, there be a stepped up use of American equipment. Uh, no, I, I, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that the, the tempo of, uh, I think these questions are best asked at the Defense Department or at, at NATO, but the, uh, the tempo of operations depends on a lot of factors, and I think that, uh, you know, that tempo rises and falls based on a lot of factors, and, uh, you know, that there has been um, a, a rise recently and may fall again. Uh, but again, it's about fulfilling the mission that's outlined in that uh, resolution. The Libyan Margaret. State Television had video today of Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi riding about town in Tripoli. His head was sticking up through the sunroof. He seemed to be in a very celebratory mood. He was greeted by throngs of people all mm -hmm. about town. What's the administration's reaction to that? He seemed to be thumbing his nose. In, in we a have, way. We I, have I, no I reaction to, to that, which I haven't seen, except to say that, you know, I, a repressive uh, leader's ability to uh, create a little propaganda is uh, uh, not unprecedented. It happens all the time. I uh, will tell you simply that what we and our international partners are doing every day is tightening the noose around Gaddafi through the uh, sanctions that we've implemented and the other measures that we've taken. Uh, we have made it uh, increasingly uncomfortable for, for those around him. Uh, to continue to uh, stay with him because of the sanctions. As you know, some, some leaders uh, of that regime have made the choice to uh, depart from uh, the Gaddafi regime, and we look forward to, to more of that happening. I will tell you, it did look like the news was tightening around him today, and I realized, Jay, you didn't see the video yet. Uh, yes. Uh, again, the news, if I would just make the clear point that it is not the military objective of the NATO mission authorized by UN Security Council Resolution 1973 to affect regime change through military force. So the statement you just made is, is uh, somewhat meaningless because the noose I'm referring to has to do with sanctions and other non-lethal measures taken by the United States unilaterally and, and uh, with our partners. Thank Margaret. you. Uh, I hope you can bear with me. I want to ask you the question that I was going to ask Jack and then the question I was going to ask you. Um, the first is I want to follow up on Jim's um, tax expenditures question. Um, number one, uh, is the president envisioning that capital gains uh, be treated as ordinary income under this plan? And also, within the confines of the fact that this would only affect 250,000 and over families, does the administration support um, uh, getting rid of the mortgage interest deductions, Cadillac, uh, tax and Cadillac health care plans uh, further? state and local property tax deductions and charitable giving? Are those all on the table as far as you're well, concerned? Well, what I, what I think we've said generally is, is with, not with regard to any specifics that you just mentioned, is that the President believes that one of the important principles in these kind of negotiations is that everything has to be on the table, and the President, but while well, the President has also made clear uh, what his principles are and where he will not go. Uh, some of those specifics uh, that are answerable, I wish you would ask Jack. I know you didn't get a question, but I, I direct you to the Office of Management and Budget for some of that. Wait, okay, so um, so I should follow up with them on that. And then my other question is, I guess a little bit more of a political one. Um, is the White House working to try to facilitate deal making between, let's say, moderate Democrats and moderate or quasi-moderate Republicans? Uh, and do you think that ultimately the width of the coalition will determine how much you can get done out of your $4 trillion plan? Well, I think the, the reality is that there's a vote threshold necessary for any action. Uh, in the Senate, it's 60. In the House, it's 218. Uh, and are we working with lawmakers? Uh, absolutely. We're working with, you know, and we will work for, with lawmakers going forward who are serious and uh, about addressing this problem. And, and one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why the President is optimistic that something can be done is that the, the environment has changed. I think uh, Jack spoke about this when he was here, that the, uh, there is a certain realization taking hold that we need to, there is an urgency to addressing this problem, and that it requires bipartisan action, and that it requires very tough choices, and it requires Republicans and Democrats to move outside their comfort zone, to accept the fact that some of the things that need to be done to achieve the $4 trillion deficit reduction that is the general goal of everyone, it seems, in this debate, that you have to do things 
uh, that are politically uncomfortable. You have to accept that thing, you know, that the cuts that are tough choices, the President spoke about, uh, looking at tax expenditures and revenues that, uh, you know, some, some Republicans have acknowledged uh, need to be looked at. I mean, that's how this process works. And, and so the answer is we will uh, eagerly work with uh, those members of Congress who are uh, demonstrated how serious they are about this issue. Uh, yes. Under the President's plan, when does the U.S. have a balanced budget? Uh, you know, you guys saw the paper. I don't, I don't think I have a question, uh, answer on that. I think the issue is what's the size of the deficit as a ratio to, 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 G, uh, to, to the economy, to the GDP. Um, I, I don't know that we have a projection for a balanced budget within uh, you know, uh, any particular time frame, but it, it, it is the national debt, not just the deficit. But well, what look, it I, I think we put debt? out a lot of paper on that. You should, you should definitely reference uh, the, the the paper. I could, I could go get it and, and look it look it up. But if not, why don't you get back to us uh, on that? Where it, what it does for the debt, not the deficit. What does it do for the national debt? What is an acceptable national it, it, debt? It, it, uh, let me. I'll have to look it up, but. Um, Well, I don't think we made projections on employment. The, the, you know, obviously strengthening our economy and strengthening uh, uh, our, uh, our balance sheet, we believe, would, uh, while protecting the very investments that are essential to keeping the economy growing, uh, is, is, uh, will be, uh, have a very positive impact on our economy. And one of the reasons why the President, during this recent budget debate, and, 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 uh, was so uh, insistent on protecting some of these investments was because he, his, his starting position on those negotiations was we cannot do something in this process that will jeopardize the growth uh, in the economy or the uh, growth in the creation of jobs that we've seen so far. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the whole point of this exercise in the end is about making our economy stronger, making our uh, economy more fertile in terms of job creation, uh, and uh, that's why he's uh, engaged in it so uh, directly. Karen. Uh I have two questions. One is um, the speaker criticized the the group that's going to be led by the vice president who's asked you to take it off the table. I understand one thing he may be interested in is a smaller group. Is that something the president would – is there is that a subject of negotiations right now with members of Congress, leaders? And then I had just had a second one I could follow up after you answered. Uh, I, I don't believe it's a subject of negotiation. The president just laid out this uh, uh, plan, this proposal yesterday. He made clear, uh, you know, why he believed it was the right structure for uh, the negotiations. And uh, obviously there are a number of significant players in both houses of Congress who uh, are important because of their positions uh, to this kind of negotiation. And I think that's how um, we envisioned the uh, process being put forward. And each leader will appoint the members that he or she wants to, to participate. So I think that gives uh, uh, every leader uh, a great deal of flexibility in deciding who should participate. And just, just to follow up uh, on the first symbols and um, Alan Simpson, they released their, their plan you know, in December. What took so long for the president to invite them to the White House to essentially endorse their plan? What took him so long? That, well, first of all, Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson have been here on numerous occasions in the past. Uh, he announced his plan yesterday, and they came today. That's pretty fast. I know. I know. In our, in the way that the environment works these days, that it wasn't within the first hour. But he was. They were here pretty darn quickly. Time frame I'm talking about. You know, in December they they released their plan, mm -hmm. and it seems like just today or, or yesterday it was the president's. You know, sort of full endorsement of what they've done. Why did it take so long? Well, between. The two? I, I think he. What he did was uh, say that there were. Uh, that, that the commission's work was served as a uh, guidepost to, to the proposal that he put out yesterday. He didn't. Uh, he adopted some of their uh, proposals in his 2012 budget, and he adopted many more in the proposal he put forward yesterday. And continues to look to that document for ideas uh, for going forward. And I, you know, you should. It is shouldn't be lost on you that the vice president's chief of staff was the executive director of that commission, uh, and and is obviously playing an important role. Uh, going forward in all of this. So uh, the fact that the President was very appreciative of the work that they did, thought it was extremely important, was uh, the case in December and has been the case uh, every day uh, since then and, and will be the case going forward. One of the things that he was so appreciative about today in their meeting was that they have both committed to, to stay engaged in this process because they're very important voices in this and they, they helped create a framework 
that has helped change the debate and change the tone here. Uh, and that's, that's vitally important. Thanks. Okay. Forum okay. media. Thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. Forum media, please. Yeah. Next, tomorrow.